Okay, so over the next nine weeks, uh, we're going to be doing this study, God and the Bible, and um, we're going to be looking at the doctrine of God and the doctrine of the Bible, and a doctrine is just a belief. That's all that word means, is it, it's a belief, and so not anything scary with there. And the goal of the study is really not to help you just uh, grow in knowledge of who God is but that that knowledge would help you uh, grow in awe, in wonder, in amazement uh, of who God is. And I think the more that we understand who God is, the more we really understand uh, what a joy it is to be His child. And so that is, that is the ultimate goal, is that we really um, just understand the beauty and splendor of who God is and how that applies to life. So um, this is a uh, theology class, okay? Um, so how many of you love theology? All right, a couple of you. How many of you do theology? Okay, but here's the thing. Everybody does theology because as soon as you take um, any question of life and you begin to think, well, what does the Bible say about that or how should I act in this way, you're doing theology, okay? So um, you didn't know it was a verb? It is. You're doing theology. So, um, So theology, the word theos, is the Greek word for, anybody know that? What's God? So theos is the Greek word, Greek word for God, and ology just means the study of. So biology is the study of life, bio is life. So theology is the study of God, okay? That's um, what we're going to be doing. And um, it's called God in the Bible, but we're going to start with the Bible, and then the doctrine of the Bible, um, and then we'll get to the doctrine of God and we do that because um, the Bible is where we really learn who God is. It's how He revealed Himself to us. So if you ever, if you pick up any systematic theology book, they always either start with the doctrine of God or the doctrine of the Bible. Start with the doctrine of God because that's who we're studying, um, and then they'll get to the Bible somewhere else. Or you start with the Bible because that's how God has revealed Himself to us. But um, we're, we're going to start with the Bible. But before we get there... Let's talk about why it is important to study God and His revelation. So I have a long quote here from this book called Knowledge of the Holy. <clears throat> this is by A.W. Tozer, and I brought it. I brought it. I brought it. <laughs> Did I go back on? I brought it because I wanted you to see it's not a huge book, okay? But it goes through the attributes of God, one of my favorite books ever, Okay. So I would recommend that to everybody. So the first chapter in that book is called Why We Must Think Rightly About God. And he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That's like the opening sentence. What, we, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And one thing we need to understand is that a proper understanding of life in general begins with what we believe about God and believing the right things about God. So uh, let's read through this together, and we'll stop at a couple places. But he says this. He says, The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is either pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. So think about that last sentence. What does he mean that worship is either pure or base, depending on whether we entertain high or low thoughts of God? What's, what's he getting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, understanding who, what God's character is, is going to define our worship. What's, um, so I think we understand pure worship. What's base worship? Just a baseball term? <laughs> isn't it? It's low, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's low worship. It would be improper worship. It would be um, like if you think of somebody that, um, well, let's just go super low. If you think of somebody that worships pornography and that is, that is what they worship, that is a low thing, that is a base thing to follow or to worship. And so our worship is either pure or base depending on what our picture of God is and, and what, it, what, it, what the thing is that, that we're worshiping. And so a religion can never rise above its view of who God is. 
and, and what he is like. Um, so I'm, I kind of think of faith as, as just going through the motions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think yeah. of a study a couple of weeks ago, an article where people were praying with plants. <laughs> I mean, how, how much more basic can you get? Yeah, I remember that. That was uh, yeah. there was some seminary was somewhere some out east or, that yeah. Yeah, some article that yeah. they they were. Maybe it was on the internet. They're all they, holding out their hands with plants and they're praying to the plants. And they're apologizing to the plant. Yeah, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah, Rob. It reminds me. Uh, Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, and, that, and that's a great example. What Rob said is it reminds him of Cain and Abel. And so you had, <clears throat> you have, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, you have Abel that offered a right sacrifice. I have a cup of water already, Steve, if you're going to get that for me. No, it's right here. Um, <laughs> I should drink out of it, huh? <clears throat> so Abel, knowing that God is just and that there are consequences to sin because I'm sure his mother and father had told him about being kicked out of the garden and how the the covering for them was God killing animals. So that's the first animal sacrifice that is going to cover their shame, cover their sin. Abel, because he knows that, he understands who God is, no, understands that he's just, understands that there's a consequence for sin and that sin has to be covered, offers an animal sacrifice. Cain, I assume, just thought, you know what? I can kind of decide what it is that God demands. Um, and so his view of God was not of a God that was just and had a specific demand, but his God was one that, was, that he could remake in his image. And so his, his worship of God is lower than Abel's was. Um, there's a quote from a guy named, what is his name? I don't remember what his name is, but he said something along the lines that the worth of a soul can be measured by what it worships. The worth of a soul is measured by what it but we worship. So if we worship something base, then really the worth of our soul is less than if we worship God. Not that we're not created in God's image, but it's kind of that, that same idea there. Okay? So that's paragraph one. <laughs> Next paragraph. He says, For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at, given, at a given time may say or do, but what in his deep heart he conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid. For her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. She can never escape the self-disclosure of her witness concerning God. So in the middle of that uh, paragraph, he says, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. What's he mean by that? How do we move toward our mental image of God? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like uh, you hang around somebody and in high school, they're the cool crowd. Mm -hmm. Well, you dress like them, you act like them. Same thing when you focus on God. If, if you start comprehending His love, you're able to show true love, reveal it not only back to Him, but to everybody else. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I like the idea of, of high school because it's the people we look up to that we try to imitate, right, and try to be like. And so what our, whatever our picture of God is, we have a tendency in our soul, if we're looking up to God, we have a tendency in our soul to move toward Him. So if God, the God of the Bible, is good, and I said if, not it, he, he, he is good and kind and gracious and merciful and always acts right, 
then we are inspired as we look at him to be more like him. If we're growing up in a Greek culture and our gods, um, trying to remember my Greek mythology, if our gods are, you know, cheating on their wives and having um, and killing each other and there's all of this treachery within the Godhead as the Greeks looked up at that and said that those are our gods, then, then that's what they begin to act like. And so we have a tendency to move toward whatever our picture of God is. Next paragraph, he says, We were able to extract, were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. Were we able to know exactly what our most influential religious leaders think of God today, we might be able with some precision to foretell where the church will stand tomorrow. Without doubt, the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of God, and the weightiest word in any language is its word for God. Thought and speech are God's gifts to creatures made in His image. These are intimately associated with Him and impossible apart from Him. It is highly significant that the first word was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We may speak because God spoke. In Him, word and idea are indivisible. That our idea of God corresponds as nearly as possible to the true being of God is of immense importance to us. Compared with our actual thoughts about Him, our creedal statements are of little consequence. Our real idea of God may lie buried under the rubbish of conventional religious notions and may require an intelligent and vigorous search before it is finally unearthed and exposed for what it is. Only after an ordeal of painful self-probing are we likely to discover what we actually believe about God. And in that, <clears throat> that last sentence there, only after an ordeal of painful self-probing are we likely to discover what we actually believe about God. And, and it is painful to get down to that, what is it that I believe? There was a series um, that our church did down south and the question they always asked was, do you believe that what you believe is really real? Do you believe that what you believe is really real? And what, it, what they were getting to is there are a lot of people that say they believe in God. They say this is how you live, this is what God demands, this is what God says, I believe the Bible. But then you look at their life and they don't live as though that's true. And so they don't really believe that what they believe is real because they would live that way if they did if that makes sense. <clears throat> and it's... It makes me think of what James said. He kind of... Kind of the faith process. That's that test of faith that grows you, defines what you're going to believe in. Yeah, uh, you know, that's exactly... I mean, it's, it's in the trials and temptations it really comes down to, do I really believe that what I believe is real? Um... And it takes, it, the, the self-probing is painful because we have to look deep in our hearts and go, okay, do my actions line up with what I say is true? And when they don't, why? And that's painful, and it's, it's not fun, but ultimately it gets into our picture of who God is. So the last paragraph here says, A right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. It is to worship what the foundation is it is to worship what the foundation is to the temple where it is inadequate or out of plumb the whole structure must sooner or later collapse i believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to an imperfect and ennoble thoughts about god the first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of god so that's why we're doing this, is what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's going to define how we live. It's going to define um, our church. It's going to define um, the way we view the world. And so we want to have a true and a uh, right view of who God is, okay? So let's talk about how to study God here. We'll go quickly through this, but types of theology. There is theology proper, <clears throat> okay, um, which is the study of God himself. So theology proper is just a study of God. 
Okay? A study of God. A biblical theology, or biblical theology, is a study of a specific topic through the whole Bible. Okay? So if somebody says, if you pick up a book and it says a, a biblical theology, it's going to follow one thing through the whole Bible, like uh, the doctrine or the theology of salvation. And so it would start in Genesis and walk you through the entire Bible and talk about just how salvation plays through the whole thing. Or you might get um, a biblical theology of sin or biblical theology of man, but it's going to trace that one topic through the entire Bible. Then there's historical theology, the study of how theology has developed over time. And you think, well, really has theology changed over time? And you think, well, it shouldn't have changed because God hasn't changed, right? But why, why does theology change? As we become more aware of who God is? Uh huh. Mm hmm. Okay, so there's the big change between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and so you have the, the New Covenant coming in. But when we think about historical theology, what we're really doing is it's not, it's not that God has changed or theology has changed as much as the church has had to clarify what it is that they believe about God. So um, there was a man named Arius that came along, and he said that God, that Jesus is not God, uh, when the New Testament says, when John 3.16 says that he's begotten of God, Jesus is very much like God, but he's a lesser being than God. And so, a man named Athanasius had to come, and they, he began to write in response to Arius, and the church had to come together at a council and say, this is what we believe the Bible teaches. And it's not that they were, for the first time, deciding what they taught in that. They were just going there's a heresy, it is a heresy, it's wrong, here's what the Bible teaches. So you'll, you'll read things and you'll, you'll see things on the History Channel or that they'll say, well, the, the idea that Jesus is God was, uh, came into existence at this council, and they'll, they'll give you a year. And it's not that that belief came into existence, it's just the first time that the church has had, had to say, this is what we believe. Because before that, nobody questioned it, Right? So let me, give you a, let me give you a much more modern example that I think you all will understand. Biblical marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Fifty years ago, everybody would be like, what? why are you wasting our time talking about this? But now, historical theology has been that churches now, and we have it in our bylaws, we have to have that specific statement. Marriage is a union between a man and a woman. Like, we have to have that now. We have to make that statement. The church has always believed that. We just never had to make a specific statement of it before because nobody ever questioned that. So as the world changes and sin comes and uh, uh, heresies come into the church, the church has had to come and say, this is what is true and right. Okay, and you'll get some examples of that when we begin to talk about the Bible and how we got the Bible because you'll see, <clears throat> I give you some examples of different... Um, different church councils where the church came together over a specific issue to say this is what we believe, okay? Um, and then there's systematic theology, which is a, the study of God and Scripture that seeks to bring all thought into line. So a systematic theology, it's just a very systematic study. So you'll do the doctrine of the Bible, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of end times. And so systematic theology is just systematic like that. Um, the study of God in scripture. that seeks to bring all thought into line. So it's a systematic theology is trying to bring everything into one system. Yeah, yeah and, and make it all work together. So it's not... Um, so whereas a biblical theology would study one topic, systematic theology is taking all of the topics and making sure that they work together and showing don't. How it all fits together in light of who God is. Yes, showing how it all fits together in light of who God is and, and what you believe about God. Okay? Um, so there, the, 
the danger of a systematic theology is that your system can override the Bible. And so you change things to fit your system. Um, so, like in Hebrews 1... Hebrews 1, 1 and 3, it says, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, and upholds the universe by the word of His power. So when verse 3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power, what is that saying? Yeah, and it's talking about Jesus, right? So Jesus is God. You guys are just like, yeah, duh. But if you're a Jehovah Witness and you're systematic theology, everything that comes together, you have to read that and say, well, he's the radiance of the glory of God. So he's not actually, he, he's reflecting who God is and he's the exact imprint of his nature. He's not, he's not actually God. He's just like a print of him. He's a copy of him. And so their systematic theology changes to make the Bible fit. And so that's where if you ever, if you get really into theology and you go, this is my system, I love this guy. Because there's a lot of systematic theologies out there. I love this guy. Let's see, I have Wayne Grudem, Erickson. Who was the guy that was my, uh, whoever the dean of the school of theology was when I was there. You know, I have a John MacArthur systematic theology. But if I chip pick one of those and I try to make everything fit into that one, and that one becomes my authority, sometimes this gets twisted. And every systematic theology is going to disagree on something. So we just have to be careful. No, it would be more like, so all of those I would name would be orthodox. They would, be, they would, not, they would all agree on the main things, which would be Jesus is God. Salvation is uh, through grace, or I'm sorry, by faith through grace in Jesus Christ. Where they would differ would be kind of on um, uh, maybe more minor things. So like um, a Presbyterian, I would agree with on the major things, but would have a different view of baptism because they baptize infants. And that has to do with what they believe about covenants. And so they, they have a reason for that. We, as Baptists, believe that baptism is, um, is a response to your salvation. We believe it, we, believer's baptism. So you, baptism would be one thing where people would differ. Um, another would be end times and what happens at the end. And some people take that a lot more serious than other people. And some people would say, you have to believe this one thing or else you can't be a part of our church. In our church, we have people that hold to a bunch of different things. Um, so that's where those, they, they're all Christian. They're all, they all hold to the main things, but they have systems that might change based, like I said, your end times or your baptism, um, what you believe about the Lord's Supper, some of those things. Does that make sense? No, this is a great place to ask that. No. And, and here's, here's the thing. Is I, the big things, the, the, the big things are, one is the deity of Christ. Is Jesus God? The Bible is really clear that Jesus is God. A Jehovah Witness would say Jesus is not God. And so when we say salvation is by faith, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ as God... A Jehovah Witness would say, no, salvation isn't based on faith in Jesus Christ as God. Salvation is based on your, uh, your knowledge, your learning, your ability to understand God, and that's what gives you your hope for, uh, for, um, for the perfect earth. What are the, for um, paradise, thank you. I don't know why I lost that word. So, because they, they, so the picture of who God is, is is very different. Just like a Mormon, their picture of who God is is very different because in, in Mormon theology, God is Elohim, who was once a man, who was elevated to Godhood, 
who had um, had a bunch of spirit babies that came down and populated this earth. And so every Mormon believes that they can also obtain godhood one day and have their own planet. That's a very different picture than what the Bible says God is, but they get lumped into that, that picture of who God is. So it comes down to, to that really picture. When we talk about God, are we talking about the same person? Just like if I said, um, well, I've got a buddy named Steve, and he's uh, six foot three, big brown hair, has a mustache. And you say, well, I know Steve too. He's sitting right here. Well, we're talking about two different Steves if, if what we're talking about is, is different in description. Okay? No. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm listening to this. I'm confronted with a question. Okay. Uh, have I built my own systemic, systematic theology? Give us harbor our own system, systematic theology. I really shouldn't chew ice with the microphone on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's habit. Um, and is that a dangerous thing? So, so, so his question is, do we all have our own systematic theology, and is it a dangerous thing? We likely have all, we, we probably all, I would say we all likely have our own systematic theology, whether we've thought about it or not. When you stop and somebody asks you a question, how does this fit, you probably have, well, I would think this is how it fits, and, and you're doing your systematic theology. How does salvation fit with the character of who God is? You're, you're, you're putting together a system. The, the real danger, I think, is when we get to a place of saying, this is, um, this is absolute. So uh, Al Mohler has a really helpful thing. Um, he talks about levels of triage. You guys want to know what triage is? If you go into the emergency room, they come out and they do triage. And if you're at first level triage, you go straight back. If you're second level they'll make you wait a little while. If you're third level, you're out in the waiting room for hours and hours and hours, right? So there's first level triage stuff that we have to deal with. And if you um, disagree with, you are not a Christian. And so that would be, um, again, the deity of Christ. Salvation is through uh, faith in Jesus Christ, not works. Um, th those are first level things. Second level things would be things that we would... Um, we can both be Christians, but we're probably not going to go to the same church. So like baptism, like I mentioned with Presbyterians, you know, Baptists and Presbyterians. I've, I, one of my favorite preachers is a Presbyterian, but I wouldn't go to his church because I think he's wrong on baptism. And so that's a second level thing. And then third level things would be things that we can disagree about, but be in the same church. And I think that would be like end time stuff. Like we can, we can disagree about that and be in the same church. Where we get in trouble is where we take a third-level thing and make it a first-level thing. And, I, and I've known that, where there are people that will say, take eschatology, the study of end times, and make that a priority. And if you don't believe the same about us, then you can't be in our church. So that's where I think we get, we get into danger. We have to understand, here's the core level one stuff, and we have to be solid there. Level two stuff, you know, we can maybe flex a little bit. I say, this is my opinion. This is what I think is biblical. But you know what? I'm not going to say you're a heretic if you disagree with me. And then level three stuff, we just go, you know, this is what I think. But if you put a gun to my head, I'll change real fast. <laughs> you know? Um, because it's just, there are some things there that just aren't clear. So. The filling of the Holy Spirit, I would say, would be a level two thing. Although it it could become a level one thing if you say, I think it becomes a level one thing if you say that the filling of the Holy Spirit um, is, is... If you say that the, whole, if the, the filling of the Holy Spirit is um, shown by speaking in tongues, and if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not a Christian. Well, then you've just taken that and said that's a level priority one thing. I think what you believe about the sign gifts is a level two thing. Um, I'm probably not going to go to a church where I, where, where I disagree about that with somebody. It's just going to be a very different church, and um, so I would say that's a level two thing. Some people would make it a level three thing, um, and I've known some cases like that where people are like, eh, I kind of believe that, but I go to a church that doesn't, but it's not really that big a deal to me. 
Right. You know, what I believe or don't believe or don't understand about them kind of things. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, Dan's right. You have a lot of questions, huh? <laughs> You're looking at me. Like... Yeah, and that's and that that is that, that there will be. I remember I worked uh, my after my freshman year of college. I worked uh, construction, and the guys that I worked with. Um, we're all Christians, and we were in the truck one day, and they're like, have you spoken in tongues? I was like, what? No. Like, and they're like, well, you're not a Christian. I was like, really? Oh, man. <laughs> My parents are going to be so disappointed. Um, but I was just like, <laughs> so they had made that like a, a level one thing, like this is a, a non-negotiable, and that's, that's the level one things, or these are things that are non-negotiable. So that's where we get all that from. Yes, Steve, we get into danger if we make our systematic. We start moving our triage around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's where sometimes you'll have friends that you disagree with and you guys can sit and argue for an hour and then be good and walk away and then there's people that you can't or else the relationship's just totally shattered. So it's, it's tough. All right. <laughs> we might get done with this page. Um, so let's talk about what our presuppositions are. We have to understand that everybody has presuppositions. Um, and we want to recognize and be clear about what our presuppositions are. You want one of these? So, presupposition number one, the Bible is true and is the standard of truth. The Bible is true and it is the standard of truth. First of all, what's a presupposition? <laughs> Sabina, what's a presupposition? I, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yep. So a presupposition is something that you believe beforehand. And so it shapes the way you view all of the world. Okay? So the Bible is true and it is the standard of truth. I want to be very clear on this because um, when I read the Bible on Sunday mornings, I say, I usually say something like, this is God's holy and imperfect and perfect word. But I've been told that I don't enunciate and somebody asked somebody, I don't remember how this came to me, but they thought I was saying that it is God's in, imperfect. his holy imperfect word, like not perfect. So I need to enunciate better. And so I'm, I'm, from, I'm going to try this Sunday to say, this is God's perfect and holy word, and just put perfect first. But I want to be really clear, this is true, this is perfect. Yeah, that makes, I don't know. So man, I'll just... Okay, presupposition number two, God exists and has revealed himself in the Bible. God exists and he has revealed himself in the Bible. So as you can tell through from those, so number one, the Bible is true and is the standard of truth. And number two, God exists and has revealed himself in the Bible. So as we do this study, we're going to spend our time looking at what the Bible says about who God is because our presupposition is that this is true and this is the means that God has chosen to tell us who He is. We can know some things about God from creation, but specific things, this is how God has chosen to reveal it. So um, this is, this is our, our rule and our law. So why study theology? Why study theology? Number one, a very simple reason. Look at Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, 19. Someone want to read that for us? Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so what are we commanded to do? 
Go. Make disciples. Okay? So in the going is, is the preaching. And so we are commanded to go and preach and to make disciples and baptize them. So if you're going to go and, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded. And so if we're going to go make disciples, we're to make people that follow God, that means we have to do theology because we have to, we have to do more than just say, um, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved and say, okay, now you're saved. But then you have somebody that says, yeah, but have you met my three-year-old because I, I'm going to kill them? because they are, they are three, and I'm tired, and I'm exhausted, and I can't sleep at night, because they get up, and you have to, well, how do you follow Jesus with a three-year-old that doesn't sleep at night? A lot of prayer, lot of prayer right? <laughs> and and, that's, and that's, that's where we, we begin to do theology, and we, we are helping people to follow Jesus, not just with facts about who God is, but to follow Jesus in every area of life. And so if we're going to teach people how to follow God, we have to help them not just understand the gospel, but understand what it means to follow God and to observe all that he has commanded. How do you take the commandments of God and apply them to life? How do you take a high school student that says, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I know I'm supposed to honor my father and mother, but and then tell you this horrible story about what their father and mother are like. Well, you have to explain the doctrine of forgiveness. You've been forgiven. Yeah, you have to start doing theology, right? You, yeah, and you have to know what the Bible says. Honor yeah. your mother and father. That's a command from what is true. God's word. Yep. So why do we study theology? The number one simple reason is we're commanded to. We have to. Okay? I think that's wrapped up in the Great Commission there. And then number two, there are benefits to doing theology. Benefit number one is obeying God makes life better. Or number A there. I did, I did letters, right? A. Obeying God makes life better. Knowing who He is and how He wants us to act makes our life better. I think one of the... Um, One of the, the most important, uh, most important, a key verse, I think, is First John 5, 3. Um, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and my commandments are not burdensome. Like, really beginning to understand that God doesn't make, give us commands just to make our life hard. He gives us commands that are best for us, so obeying him actually makes life better. So in Philippians 1, 9, Paul is praying, he says, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Paul is praying that they would grow in knowledge and understanding of him so that they could live this abundant life, so that they could prove who God is, so that they could prove, as you go on and you read in Philippians, that God... Um, Philippians 121, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, how, why would it be, why is that true? Why is it better to live for Christ? Why is he worth more than everything else? Because obeying him makes life better. Um, yes? Can you really obey God if you don't really know who he is? What do you guys think? Can you obey God if you don't know who he is? I would think not. You might accidentally. <laughs> accidentally. Yeah. Um, and I think there are, we're going to talk, one of the things we'll talk about in a week, a couple of weeks, um, is we'll talk about the evidences for God. How do we know God exists? And one of the things that we're going to talk about is uh, the moral argument for God. Like, how does morality take us to the fact that God exists? And I think that that is a way that there are a lot of moral people out there that just obey God because it's the right thing to do. It's how the best way to live in society. So in that case, they might obey like the Ten Commandments, but like we talked about on Sunday, you know, what God cares about most is our heart and do we love Him? And so in that case, no. You can't love who you don't know. Okay? Uh, letter B. The second benefit to studying theology is it helps us overcome wrong ideas. 
you can't, you can't study every false idea that's out there, but the more you know the true things about God, the more the false will stand out to you just as being icky. <laughs> um, to, to, two illustrations. One, you've probably heard this before, but how, do, how does the FBI teach their agents to identify counterfeit bills? They don't study counterfeits because... Th- you, you just you can't study all of them, so what do they do? They spend all of their time studying actual bills. So they know so well that what an actual bill looks like that when they see a counterfeit, they're just like, yeah, there's something wrong there. So they study the real things so that the counterfeits are horrible. The second, um, the second one that um, example I would give was uh, Plato wrote a book, The Republic, where he is creating the perfect city in philosophy, okay? He's creating this perfect city. So one of the things he decided to do as the city grows is you have to have guardians that will guard society. They're the ones that are tasked with protecting the society from everything that is evil and everything that is um, base, since we used that word earlier. That's their job. And so how, how are they going to raise the guardians? Well, they raise the guardians, they only let them see the best art and they only let them hear the best music um, and he goes through this list of things. And why do they do that? So that when something comes that is not good, they're naturally repulsed by it. They're just like, oh, that's gross. That's not right. And so one of the things, studying theology just helps us uh, avoid things that are wrong. And so you'll be, you'll, you know, somebody will come knock on your door and they'll make an argument and you're like, that is a great argument. Wow. I don't know what it is, but I know it's wrong. Come back next week, I'll tell you why it's wrong. And you've probably had that happen where people make such a great argument and you're just like, wow, I, I don't know, but that just sounds wrong. <laughs> well, it's, that happens as you study the Bible. Um, number three, why do we do theology or letter C? It helps us apply Scripture. There are things in Scripture that, that are not specifically addressed. Um, and so theology helps us know how to approach things. As we learn the character of who God is and the basic principles for life, you can take God's character and his principles and go, well, here's how I think you should think about that aspect. Um, you know, back in Jesus' time, they, they didn't have a lot of the technology, um, a lot of the technology that we have just didn't exist back then. But that doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't speak to those things of how we should use technology. Um, the most Back then, most marriages were arranged. So, you know, people didn't date. Your mom and dad just went, there you go, that's the one. Enjoy life. <laughs> but the Bible still, we can draw a lot of principles that we can just say, okay, here's what that relationship would look like. Uh, The last one, D. It helps us grow in our love for God. Studying theology helps us grow in our love for God. And this is what I said in the beginning. One of my hopes is, as we talk through all of this, you'll gain knowledge about who God is, but more to the point that you'll grow in seeing Him as beautiful, seeing His majesty, seeing His splendor, really just understanding that the God that we serve is amazing and beautiful, and well worth enjoying. Um, This is kind of a side note, but we've got four minutes, so um, not enough time to do anything else. I was listening, I started looking at a book I'd read years before, and then started um, looking at something on the internet by the same author, and he was making the point that um, what drove Oprah Winfrey away from her church was the idea that God is jealous and that we should praise God. She said, that just seems egotistical. Is it egotistical for God to demand that we praise Him, that we delight in Him, that we love Him above everything else? And he went on to say that's actually pretty much what took Brad Pitt out of faith too. And you read that, you well, I guess... I mean, it, it is egotistical to say you should praise me 
and I should be your greatest delight, if it's me, if, 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 if as a person we say I'm the greatest of everything and everybody should worship me, what I'm doing is I'm distracting them from the thing they actually should be worshiping. And the thing we should be worshiping is God because He is deserving of all praise and He is deserving of all glory. And so for God to say, delight in me isn't egotistical, it's what's best for us because He's the one that saves us. And so it's not egotistical for God to say, give me praise, exalt my name because that's what's best for us. It's the most loving thing that He can do for us. And so for us to praise God is the natural thing that you do when you love something. If you go to a great restaurant, you praise that restaurant, you tell your friends, hey, you should go to this place, it's good. As a husband, I praise my wife and I say, I tell her she's beautiful and she's lovely and I love her and I enjoy doing that because I love her. And it's just the natural response of, of a people that loves something. And so for us to, to love God and to seek Him above everything else is, is good. And as God demands that and wants us to know Him, it's not an ego trip on His part. It's just saying, I want you to know what's best for you because I am the one that saves you. And I am the place that you will find satisfaction and pleasure and joy and happiness is in me. So that's what we're going to do. Um, Oh, one last thing, and just kind of introduction. The difference between apologetics and theology. So theology is the study of God. Um, what's apologetics? Yeah, defending the faith. Apologetics is defending the faith. Apologetics is not apologizing for the faith. Now, some people think that sometimes. They're just like, well, I'm sorry. This is what the Bible teaches. No, apologetics is defending the faith. So there are two dis- different disciplines the study of God, and then defending the faith. Um, but we'll cross over into apologetics a little bit. Like I, like I said, one of the things we'll talk about is arguments for the, uh, the existence of God. What are some apologetic arguments or philosophical arguments to say, yes, God exists? Okay, so that's our introduction. Next week, we'll start into the doctrine of Scripture. Um, any questions? No? All right. Um, okay. It's just sad that uh, people like Oprah Winfrey and Brad Pitt just sort of never got the idea. They never got it. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we think uh, our parents demanded that we do things and don't do things for our protection because they love us. Yeah. Our teachers demanded that we do things or that we could learn stuff, you know? Yeah. So that we can be better people. Just, I mean, it's just sad that we see it over there. Yeah. It makes me wonder well, who were they worshiping? Who did they think uh, God was? Or if when they think they've got a better idea about something, they can just. Well, that. And that goes, that goes to, our, to what we read in the beginning, is what we believe about God is the most important thing about us. And so as Oprah believes things that are lower about God than the way God reveals himself, that, that's where you end up. And I, I remember, I just popped in my mind, uh, I was, I was in, we were living in Hawaii back then, so 20 years ago she gave an interview and she was talking about you know, her leaving. She grew up in a little Baptist church, and the pastor said, God is jealous and she said, I just remember sitting there and thinking, what's God, God got to be jealous of me about? And she just totally misunderstood what it meant by God's jealousy. God is jealous when we worship something other than Him, and that's a total right, appropriate jealousy. Um, so, yeah, that, and that's, again, why it's important to do theology. Is like, this is what we believe about God. This is who He is. This is what He's like. All right? Let me pray and will be dismissed. God, we thank you for revealing yourself to us, God, and we look forward to these next several weeks as we um, look at your word and look at who you are, God. Help us to enjoy the splendor and beauty of who you are. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you.